Is economics a science or is it just propaganda? This is important. If someone wants to get you to believe something that benefits them, they often pretend that they're doing science to have you put your guard down. Fad diets and alternative medicine do this all the time. They use sciency language, present themselves as scientists, and now your guard is down because you don't think that someone is trying to sell you something. It's sort of a filter for new information that they're going to give you. I argue that the same thing happens in mainstream economics, and what they want to sell is your consent. Consent for laws and social norms and habits that benefit the already rich and powerful instead of the people. These laws obviously benefit the already well-off, so they need this fake science to make you believe that it's somehow in your interests or better for everyone. And this thinking has permeated into many areas of our lives, and into many fields of academics as well. Well, today I'm going to tear down one of these tenets. Supply and demand theory is bullshit. Specifically, it's pseudoscience that is kept around because assuming that it's true justifies a lot of economic policies the rich really benefit from. For example, shifting government services like schools and healthcare, which are provided based on need and paid for by taxes, to ones that are based on profit maximization or even outright privatization. Things like introducing market competition into social services like retirement benefits or insurance or utilities instead of centrally administering them. These all require supply and demand theory to be justified, and this video is going to tear that down. Okay, okay, enough grandstanding, let's actually get to it. Most of the economists in the Western countries, and especially in America, belong to a political ideology which they call neoclassical economics. But for those unfamiliar, what is neoclassical economics? To start with, it's an ideology. It's the academic branch of neoliberalism, which may as well be called the state ideology of the United States and Western Europe because every major politician and think tank adheres to it. Basically, the thing that the already rich want is uncontrolled capitalism, and they need to sell it to you. The ideology that they have supporting this type of capitalism is called neoliberalism, and the fake science that they use to justify it is called neoclassical economics. It's like when the healing crystals woman wants you to buy her essential oils, she has an ideology of mystic healing and alternative medicine, and then some phony studies which support her claims. Or when the pickup artist wants to sell you his masculinity course. His ideology is patriarchal manhood or something else like that, and he also has bogus research to support his claims. I've torn down the basics of both neoliberalism and neoclassical economics in almost every single video that I've made. From how government spending works, to how the IMF works, to rationality being a descriptor of human behavior, but today I'm going to tear down the heart of it supply and demand. The neoliberal ideology has been influencing decades of economic research via neoclassical economics. This ideology skews research questions, it alters how results get interpreted, and because this ideology teaches its followers to not think of their preconceptions as an ideology at all, researchers who believe in neoliberalism become blind to all of this. In the worst cases, entire studies are constructed to fit the pre-constructed beliefs of their ideology. So let's state the basic parts of neoclassical economics first. Supply and demand theory is something that comes later. These are the sort of starting assumptions of their worldview. Oftentimes, they're not even said out loud, just like how a chemist wouldn't feel the need to say that they assume that matter is made out of atoms at the start of every one of their talks. Here are the three big parts of neoclassical economics. First, the world is fundamentally made up of individuals, so studying society means starting with individuals. Second, markets are the natural way that all economies operate and have operated. They should be thought of as the preferred default. Third, human nature is static and fixed. Whenever humans interact, they inevitably create capitalist relations and market mechanisms. These core beliefs are very useful to the capitalist class because it justifies their existence. They're natural, they're inevitable, and they're even beneficial. It also teaches people to atomize society. 
You are so different from everyone around you that you shouldn't think of cooperating or forming bonds which are outside of money. There are no classes or races or genders or anything of that. So with these beliefs, the current model of capitalism is natural. It's the best. And you should think of any alternatives not as equally viable forms of society, but as modifications to this natural way. Thus, any problems which could be coming around must be because the system is being perturbed. In this ideology, capitalism isn't even an economic system. The way things work under capitalism is just the way that things are and always have been. You wouldn't hear a physicist talking about how the four fundamental forces are a system. It's just the way things are to them. In fact, to a neoliberal, there are no economic systems. It's just capitalism and constrained capitalism. The idea that some other economic arrangement, some other social structure, could be equally as valid is entirely impossible in this worldview. The idea that some other idea like universal healthcare or public schooling or universal housing might actually be the best and that free market capitalism is an inefficient modification is also impossible to think about in this ideology. And again, all of this serves to maintain the status quo. It constrains what the public think is possible when advocating social change. It makes the public less likely to think alternatives are even possible or beneficial. People will advocate for regulating markets instead of outright removing and replacing them. And because most of the academic researchers in Western countries are followers of this ideology, it makes anyone with a different ideology seem either anti-science or ignorant. Here's a quote from anthropologist David Graeber that expresses this. Part of the problem is the extraordinary place that economics currently holds in the social sciences. In many ways, it is treated as a kind of master discipline. Just about anyone who runs anything important in America is expected to have some training in economic theory, or at least to be familiar with its basic tenets. As a result, those tenets have come to be treated as received wisdom is basically beyond question. One knows one is in the presence of received wisdom when, if one challenges it, the first reaction is to treat one as simply ignorant. You obviously have never heard of the Laffer Curve. Clearly you need a course in Economics 101. The theory is seen as so obviously true that no one who understands it could possibly disagree. What's more, those branches of social theory that make the greatest claims to scientific status start from the same assumptions about human psychology that economists do. Curious considering experimental psychologists have demonstrated over and over again that these assumptions simply aren't true. The neoliberal ideology appears in many ways. For example, a common term among the followers of neoclassical economics is market failures. This term is pretty revealing to the psyche of everyone that has this ideology. It inherently implies that markets are the natural default and that they normally work perfectly. They then talk about how to correct for these failures, which again implies that the outcome predicted by a normally functioning market is the natural default and above all most desirable outcome. If we just tweak the conditions, we can find a way to sort of nudge the market into the place that we want it, but never too much because of course that would be upsetting things. But okay, how do they actually justify markets for all of this stuff? This is where supply and demand theory comes in. It's used in two ways. Number one is that supply and demand theory is simply applied to every situation. This goes along with the idea that everything is naturally a market anyway. Why is this expensive? Well, you know, supply and demand. Why is this so rare? Well, you know, it's supply and demand. Why did this economic crisis happen? Well, it was, you know, supply and demand. The second use is to try and prove that markets are the best way to handle production and distribution. There is a law of supply, a law of demand, and then when the market can work its magic without pesky interference by unions or governments or anything, then those two natural laws combine to create the best, most efficient outcome. This is supply and demand theory. And that's exactly what I'm here to debunk. I just went over why they believe it for ideological reasons, so we're halfway there. Next, I'm going to fully debunk the fake math that's used to support it. And it's actually pretty basic. But first, a quick word about the Patreon. 
I do not run ads on my videos because I see them as a deep invasion of privacy and I don't want to be involved with that. I use uBlock Origin and I highly encourage all of you to do the same. I will never take sponsorships because that's just an ad that you can't skip. I also release all of my videos under Creative Commons share alike and I strongly disagree with how copyright works. So if I were to get money for making these videos, the only way would be something like Patreon. Becoming a patron gets your name in the credits and exclusive updates. No actual content I ever make will ever be paywalled. You only get charged as a patron if I release a video, and I always keep the number of patrons and the amount I make public. Consider that if you have a few bucks to spare. The people kind enough to support this video are on screen now. And a special thanks to Crimeberry, Jay Grookey, Joyful, and Temnospondyl. Apologies for the different audio quality, I record this part last. Now, back to the video. Take a trip with me to the fantasy world of neoclassical economics. It's in this world, and not our real world, that we build the theory of supply and demand. I'm going to explain this in roughly the same way that you would be explained it in a college microeconomics course. First, there is just one group of people, all of whom are individuals, don't forget, who are entirely equal, and they trade with each other. How nice. Already, there are some big assumptions here about what equal and trade mean. Remember, the whole goal here is to make models fit within neoclassical economics because that's the academic justification for neoliberalism. So it shouldn't be surprising that the starting point is some propaganda about what capitalism and markets are like. But let's roll with it. Also notice that because everyone is the same, there are no separate classes, say, of suppliers and demanders. Neoclassical econ says that anyone can be on the supply side if they're selling, and anyone can be on the demand side if they're buying. To support this, one of the assumptions is that there are zero costs to enter and exit the market. They sometimes call this frictionless exit and entry. See, there are really no differences between your boss and you. You selling an old CD player on Facebook Marketplace is the exact same thing as your boss selling the products of your labor. You're actually the same thing. You're just, you know, in different situations. Again, this is obviously a stupid assumption. There is definitely high costs to both entering and exiting markets of all kinds, so it should be pretty clear that this is ideologically driven. To try and model capitalism as a situation where a group of completely equal individuals all have equal access to products and the means to produce them is, well, it's a bold move. It seems to me that they try to model capitalism as what communists say that communism will be, a classless, stateless, moneyless society. So pretty obviously already this should be grounds for throwing away the theory entirely. We've gotten through, what, two of their assumptions? But let's make a comparison with chemistry to see why I think that even from this, this theory is pretty much worthless. Let's say that a chemist has some reaction that they're trying to understand, and it's between two chemicals. One chemist has a good idea for why the reaction produces the end products that it does. They sit down and they say, okay, this model assumes that inside the reaction vessel, there's no oxygen. Well, if it turns out that there is a substantial amount of oxygen in the environment, then this model is wrong. The same thing just happened with neoclassical economics. We have the real world coming up against this imaginary place where everyone can instantly start producing any product they want to sell it. Neoclassical economics likes to think that assumptions and predictions are two different things. They aren't. They're the same thing. An assumption for your model is the same as a prediction of your model. One of them just comes from the other one. But if some of your assumptions are proven to be wrong, then whatever your model predicts is also wrong. Okay, okay, we get it. This is really unrealistic. But there's another problem. Let's say we actually want to take this idea seriously. We're going to ignore the fact that our model assumes things which are not true. How do neoclassical economists proceed from here to model supply and demand? How do they define supply and how do they define demand? Well, one idea you might have for supply would be to see how many producers are producing something at a given time. I mean, you could go to the store and there are a limited number of boxes of Cheerios on the shelves. It's hard to argue that that's not the supply of Cheerios. 
And the same could be said for demand. How many people, when asked, want something? Whether they can buy it or not doesn't really matter. That's not what we're after. This would be a great way to define both supply and demand. We could directly measure supply. In fact, companies track production almost religiously. Just look at how many of a type of shirt are produced, and we know the supply of that shirt. We can also survey to get an idea of demand. If we survey a thousand people in a country of 10 million, and 500 of them say they would like to buy this shirt, we can easily make an estimate for what the demand is. Defining supply and demand this way gives us an insight into something important. Shortages and surpluses are not two ends of a spectrum. They're in fact entirely different. There can be food on store shelves which is unsold and people who want it but can't buy it. A surplus and a shortage. Then we could ask why these people can't buy something. Well, they simply don't have the money to do it. They just don't have the purchasing power. And you might ask, why were these things made to begin with? If only 200,000 people could afford to buy this shirt, why were 400,000 made? Then we might think about, wouldn't it be easier if we simply planned how much to produce for these basic things, making sure that everyone who wants something was able to get one? We would also know how much of each type of labor that we need to make it, and also how many natural resources of certain units that we would need. We could plan out exactly how much work everyone would need to do so no one is either overworked or underworked or would have to go without the things they need. From each person, we could get their abilities, and to each person, we could provide their needs. Okay, so neoclassical economists obviously don't do this. They do not try to define supply and demand in this way. They usually have a strong aversion to doing things in material terms. Instead, they say that there is a relationship between the price of something and the quantity of something. Specifically, two relationships. The first relationship is between the price of something and how much of it will be offered up for sale. The second is between the price of something and how much of it people will want to buy. I'm going to draw this relationship as two curved lines. This one relates the price to how much will be offered for sale, and it's called the supply curve. This one relates the price to how much will be bought, and it's called the demand curve. So does the intuition here make sense? The intuition of the supply side seems fine. Remember, we're working in a magical world where anyone can start supplying to the market. As the price of something goes up, more people would be willing to start selling it. But the demand curve seems a little far-fetched. This idea that what people want depends only on price is crazy. It's not the price of something that determines how many people want it. It's the qualities of the product, the use values you can get from it, and the needs of the people. Price doesn't enter into this at all. Price is just, like we said before, a control. It's a limiter determining who actually can and can't access the product. Price determines the amount that can be bought, not the amount that will be demanded. Human wants and needs are not in any way determined by the price of something. That's insane. Do I suddenly not need insulin if it gets expensive? Do I suddenly not get joy from seeing a movie if the ticket cost is doubled? No, that's fucking crazy. And some neoclassical economists actually agree here, because while many will say that this is what their models define supply and demand to be, it's actually the opposite. Those truly in the know about what neoclassical models say will tell you that they actually assume price is not the input variable, it's the output variable. Neoclassical econ wants to use quantities to predict prices. They're after a theory of prices, they say. That's what supply and demand theory is truly trying to get at. The reason for this, though, is that their ideology is creeping in. Neoclassical economists love the idea that there is a natural order at work in the economy that automatically sets everything into its best possible scenario, and one of these things is the price. It can't be explicit or intentional human actions that determine prices. Prices have to come about naturally. Otherwise, there would be a reason for, say, a government to set prices, or a labor union to set wage prices. So instead, they frame things as causing prices instead of prices causing human behavior. They hope to just give the model a set of initial conditions, and then the invisible hand will magically produce a price from that. So quantities are inputs, and prices are the outputs. But okay, does this actually solve the intuition though? Does this make things match up with reality, what we know about human beings? Do things actually become internally consistent? No. 
Here's why. Just having more and more of something, i.e. the quantity going up, does not mean that the price you would sell it for would also go up and up. Saying that actually really exposes the craziness. When we have the price as the output and quantity as the input, we say that as there is more of something, the selling price of it will be higher. That's ridiculous. So instead, we need to add some other explanation. There must be something that causes this correlation between quantity and price for the supply side of the economy. This is going to be covered in the third video of the series, actually. And in a small preview, the neoclassical economists build supply curves and demand curves from individuals. And the supply curve is based on combining the amount produced for each of an infinite number of suppliers. But that's unimportant to this argument right now. Back to this basic version just with lines. Again, neoclassical economists have made a model that is easily disproven using real-world examples. Find me a psychology study that shows as the amount of something someone has goes up, the more that they will charge to sell it. But let's put all that aside for now and stick to these two equations. We'll just assume that they both make sense. Okay, there are two relationships here. Let's simplify them a little more. I'm going to start with demand. The simplest relationship we can have between two variables is a linear one. And remember, we're relating the price of a product to the quantity that's demanded. A linear relationship means that we've got a coefficient here. Price is multiplied by some number, and that tells us the quantity that will be demanded. This number is assumed to be negative, because neoclassical econ says that as the price of something rises, the amount demanded will fall. Let's plot this on the graph. Well, it seems like our line starts at zero, zero. At zero dollars, zero will be demanded, and then it goes negative. So we actually need another part added to this equation. This new part is how much is demanded when price is zero. So demand is defined using this linear equation. We have two variables, the price and quantity, and two coefficients, the slope and the intercept. We can also do the same thing for supply. And we don't actually need an intercept, since it somewhat makes sense that there will be nothing supplied if the price is zero. Who's going to sell something if they can't make any money? We again have a slope which multiplies by price to find the number which tells us how much would be offered for sale. So supply is defined using a linear equation as well. There's one coefficient, and again the same two variables, price and quantity. Now would you look at that? The sexiest thing to any neoclassical economist, two lines, that intersect. This intersection is called the equilibrium. And very importantly, it's the only part of this entire theory which we can actually observe. At any given time, we can only ever see a single price and a single quantity. And that's exactly where the problem is. We've got our two equations. These are the simplest possible that they can be. If we get rid of any of these coefficients, the model stops making sense. In fact, if we get rid of the slopes, we're assuming that there isn't a relationship between price and quantity. They would just be flat lines. So we need them there. And we need the intercept for demand. Otherwise, the equilibrium is at zero, zero. Markets where nothing is traded, and it's at zero dollars. We could imagine that these linear relationships are unrealistic. We might need curves, but that would be adding squared and cubed aspects and making more coefficients. This is the minimum amount. We have two variables and three coefficients. Now, how do we actually observe in real life? Well, we see how much was bought and then what the price was. So we can observe this point right here. So let's say that in our example, we do an observation and it was six and nine. Some of you may have already spotted the problem. We end up with two equations and after plugging in the numbers, we have three unknowns. This is mathematically unsolvable. We cannot figure out what the supply and demand lines are given the data. Our entire model of supply and demand is impossible to determine from observation. There are an infinite number of solutions to this problem. This one works, and so does this one, and this one as well. This is a gigantic deal for what is supposed to be something that actually exists. How are we supposed to do any sort of science with this if we can't use observations to check our model? Whatever point you give me, I can find an infinite number of supply and demand curves that solve to get it, and all of them are equally valid. 
you can't prefer one over the other based only on the observation. But okay, look, let's wait and see if we get another observation at a different price and quantity. Wouldn't that help? We just wait around and we check maybe tomorrow or over the course of a year. You might think so, but no, just like before, we can't solve this either. We have two points now, but we also have four equations. Each time we observe a price-quantity pair, we again have an infinite number of possible lines for supply and demand. It could have been either the supply line moving, or the demand line moving, or some combination of them. There are still an infinite number of solutions to these equations. No matter what we do, we cannot use this definition of supply or demand. It is not science. It is pseudoscience. Specifically, this form of pseudoscience is what's called non-falsifiable. Falsifiability is a huge deal for science. You have to be able to have an observation which could prove your model wrong. Okay, but maybe we can get creative. What if we do have a whole bunch of points? Maybe we observe this market over five years and we have almost 2,000 observations. What if we try to do something like linear regression, where we use all of these points to try to find maybe the lines that best fit them? First, let me say half-jokingly that linear regression and its consequences have been a disaster for the human race. But as you might expect, we are again going to run into problems. But remember, at this point, any chemist or biologist would have long abandoned this theory. Economists have decided to not only let it stick around, but have made it a core part of their other theories. It's because they're ideologically driven. They need this to justify their actual political goals. That's why they're keeping it around. It's not about actually trying to understand the world. It's about justifying things that they want to do. But sure. Let's set up the equations that we're going to do the regression on. It's the supply and demand equations. The only difference here is that I've added a constant to supply. This is our intercept from before, and like we said earlier, we expect it to be zero. But for good linear regression, you should always include it, because what if it's not zero? That's actually somewhat of a hot take in statistics, but literally come fight me, I'm right. Now, you should notice something strange here. We have one set of data points, but we're expecting to get two completely different relationships from it? How could there be two lines that best fit this data? Even more so, how could they have opposite slopes? This is conceptually made even worse when we remember that neoclassical economists don't like there being different classes in society. So we can't somehow split these points up into, say, supply and demand, whatever that would mean. There aren't suppliers and demanders. There are just individuals. So we probably should have expected this from the start. What some neoclassical econ folks have done is lean into this, not realizing that this is pretty much a glaring red flag and that their starting principles are bullshit. They instead plow straight ahead. Never let new information challenge your fundamental beliefs, I guess. Running a linear regression on these data points is possible. You can run a linear regression on basically any data points if you want. If you do some simple math, you can actually find what the linear regression would be approximating. And, no surprises to us, it ain't a supply or demand curve. So what they do to make their predictions is to add yet another observable variable. Maybe energy cost or weather or location of the sale. If you do this, you can actually do some mathematical rearranging and get an estimate for the original slopes of supply and demand. But again, this is ludicrous. What economists do is say, okay, well, there must be two relationships between price and quantity. And then they try and write it down, and it's obvious that the math just doesn't work out. So you make the math work nice, but conceptually, it's nonsense, and it can't even be falsified. So they say, well, let's add in some other worthless thing like energy cost, or temperature, or labor cost, or something. These would affect prices and quantities, right? If it's suddenly cold, people will demand more heat. And if there's an oil price increase, then suppliers will provide less gasoline. So they run these other regressions, and then they ignore those findings about how fuel cost and electricity cost and location both affect price of a good and quantity of a good. They instead try to shoehorn those findings into saying something about price and quantity. You should be pulling your hair out right now. If this is not a true show of how ideology completely blinds these people and how it's an almost religious dogma that's at work in neoclassical economics, then I don't know what is. 
they find great predictors for price and quantity, things which are actually measurable, and they make actual predictions of them. They find out how sales are affected by various real-world measurable things like weather and input shocks, and that they ignore all of it. Bro, what? <laughs> what? So what happens when you use these other things to try and predict price? What if you see how much oil was used to produce something? Or maybe how much electricity or how much steel? Which one is actually the best at predicting price? Some researchers have actually done this. This idea is actually the original idea of economics, the labor theory of value. This theory states that the best predictor of price is going to be proportional to the average amount of labor that it takes to make that thing. And not just any labor, by the way. A slow craftsman making a chair in two hours while a skilled one makes it in one hour will not mean that the value of the chair made in two hours is double the price. They're talking about socially necessary labor here, i.e. what it takes society on average to produce this chair. And Using data that countries publish, you can actually look up socially necessary energy, or even socially necessary electricity. The only problem that you run into is what to do with, say, the energy required to make the inputs themselves. Think about it this way. Making a chair requires a saw, wood, and labor. But the saw itself required labor and steel to make. And the steel required some labor and also electricity and iron ore. And that labor also required some food which required some labor, and so on and so on forever. This is actually a simple solution though. It's an infinite series, but it converges. It's what's called vertical integration. A fancy word, but really it's simple. All we have to do is keep a running total of the labor. So just really simply, if it takes one hour to make a chair, and that chair is made from two pieces of wood and one saw, we can do the following. Well, the saw can make 10,000 chairs before it breaks. The saw provides to each chair however much it took to make the saw divided by 10,000. That's how much labor the saw is adding to the chair. Or electricity. Or steel. Whatever it is. We keep going like this until the values converge to within a rounding error. Maybe we get down to say one second of labor power. Or one joule of electricity. Or one milligram of oil. We then get the proportional amount of socially necessary labor or socially necessary oil or electricity that it takes to make each product. And then we can see if this actually is proportional to prices. Well, it turns out that when you do this, labor beats all of the other predictors. And sure, there are shortcomings in the statistical work supporting the labor theory of value, but they're often overblown by people. And the more robust studies which test this theory are often unknown about or simply ignored. But there are shortcomings. But this is all basically irrelevant because the main people pointing out the shortcomings in the labor theory of value support some sort of supply and demand based theory of prices. Which, again, as we've seen, is nonsense. Any serious consideration of which theory to support of where prices come from has to be the labor theory. Because supply and demand are simply pseudoscience. It's like a fundamentalist Christian talking about the gaps in the evolutionary record or the shortcomings of paleontology. Those are irrelevant if the thing you're comparing it to is creationism. So supply and demand are not science. You can't explain prices solely with quantity, something which was pretty dubious to assume from the get-go. But some economists know this, and they have a trick up their sleeves to save their religion. Again, they need supply and demand to work because they need free markets. Free markets need to inarguably be the best way to organize the economy, because policies which enable free markets are things which benefit the rich at the expense of the masses. Government price controls, single-payer systems, rationing, all of the rest of these have to be terrible and inefficient just from a mathematical standpoint because they don't let the people with the most money control the entire economy. Remember, when the market decides how something is distributed or what gets produced, it just means that money decides. The people with the most money are what determines the market. The conclusion that these people need is to just let the rich do whatever benefits them most and to have all the other nations be forced to participate. 
once controls are lifted, it lets foreign capitalists buy up roads and healthcare and trains and resources to earn monopolistic profits on them. Profits which don't go to providing other social services or supporting things which aren't profitable, but just to making themselves richer and more powerful. It is so obviously a horrible idea that no one would agree to this. So they have to play this charade that actually, counterintuitively, oh, isn't it so surprising that letting this happen will be what's best for everyone. It's, it's efficient, even. The free market core mythology argues, in effect, that the most ruthless, selfish, opportunistic, greedy, calculating plunderers, applying the most heartless measures in cold-blooded pursuit of corporate interests and wealth accumulation, will produce the best results for all of us <laughs> through something called the invisible hand. <laughs> and Keynes really, he mocked that too. He, I, I, he didn't have as many, as many adjectives of I, as I did, but he said, he said how do they think that, that the most wicked, I, I that was the word he used, the most wickedest people pursuing the most wickedest ends for the most wickedest means are going to produce these beautiful, what, what an interesting theory. Where the hell could they ever gotten it? And then to justify that, they need mathematical models. And because they are being used to justify something that's so obviously false, they need to make insane assumptions about how the world works. And because these assumptions are so obviously false, they start with their bullshit that you shouldn't judge a model based on its assumptions. All the while, the entire model also claims that everyone participating in it is actually equal and free, because it's much easier to justify horrible violent hierarchy by just pretending it doesn't exist, that it's better for everyone, than it is to say it was maybe mandated by God. But if you really can't ignore the horrible injustices, then you can just say it was mandated by God. The outcome is what the natural forces of the market produced. The invisible hand works to make sure that whatever outcome happens from a market, where there is no government control at all, is going to be the best. The invisible hand, a term from Adam Smith, and is said to be a metaphor for how markets allocate things, is literally the hand of God. Recall here what Smith was trying to do when he wrote The Wealth of Nations, above all. The book was an attempt to establish the newfound discipline of economics as a science. This meant that not only did economics have its own peculiar domain of study, but that this economy operated according to laws of much the same sort as Sir Isaac Newton had so recently identified as governing the physical world. Newton had represented God as a cosmic watchmaker who had created the physical machinery of the universe in such a way that it would operate for the ultimate benefit of humans and then let it run on its own. Smith was trying to make a similar Newtonian argument. God, or divine providence as he put it, had arranged matters in such a way that our pursuit of self-interest would nonetheless, given an unfettered market, be guided as if by an invisible hand to promote the general welfare. Smith's famous invisible hand was, as he says in his theory of moral sentiments, the agent of divine providence. It was literally the hand of God. Adam Smith literally meant that the hand of God is what produces market outcomes. The invisible hand is the dark god of the capitalist. And just like in the 1500s, the 1600s, the 1700s, and the 1800s, the liberal think tanks of today think that their god compels them to spread his dominion over the entire world, to elevate the peoples who have not heard his good message and raise them into the truth. Just as old imperial European propaganda sought to justify imperialism under the guise of civilizing non-Christian societies, the modern capitalist propaganda perpetuates neoliberal policies by painting them as the path to prosperity and progress. The rhetoric of both eras serves to cloak self-serving interests in the guise of benevolence and development, conveniently masking the vast violences and mass exploitations. Similarly, modern neoliberal propaganda champions policies which prioritize deregulation, privatization, and free markets as means to somehow lift nations out of poverty and ensure economic development. 
ignoring the fact that these policies simply do not bring prosperity or growth, but simply increase power and wealth to domestic capitalists and international capitalists. Both historical and contemporary narratives serve to legitimize power structures and maintain the status quo, obscuring the true motives behind policies that primarily benefit the few at the expense of the many. In both cases, there is a tendency to deify economic systems, to treat them as godlike, whether through the guise of divine providence or natural laws, thereby absolving the human actors from any responsibility for the consequences of their actions. This parallel underscores the importance of critically examining the narratives that we're sold, the narratives used to justify power dynamics of all sorts and economic structures of all sorts throughout history and in the present day. So the next time some neolib tells you to think about unintended consequences of a social program which would provide housing or some new regulation on insurance markets, you can think critically about it. But like I said, there's one more trick that neoclassical econ has up its sleeve to try and save its models. What if supply and demand curves aren't relationships themselves? You silly goose, you forgot this model is actually about individuals. Why don't we start with individuals and then construct supply and demand from them? Again, this sounds good. A bit complicated, maybe, but good. And it's even more promising to the ideologues because you don't have to consider society. It's just individuals with unique preferences and nothing else. We don't have to do class analysis or talk about race or ethnicity or international imperialism. But this, as we will see, is where stuff truly goes off the rails. In the next video in this series, I'm going to cover why neoclassical demand is so horrible. In fact, in an attempt to prove the math of neoclassical demand, the economists actually disproved it, but never noticed.